Uh, well, as Darren mentioned, we're in this uh, conversation, uh, Summer of Love, and we're framing it by the uh, studies and reflection in the little letter at the end of the New Testament called First John. I feel loud, Seth, and it's going to get louder, so if you can turn me down just a little bit. Thanks, man. Um, and so we're, we're, we're the, the frame for this is Darren set up, and I talked a little bit about it last week, is as we, as we round out the first century of the church, heading into the second century, church is only 50, 60 years old by this time, when John writes his letter. And already the issues that uh, the church is contending with have shifted uh, from a pure declaration of the resurrection of Jesus, get everybody in the boat because God's coming back, Let's to a more, oh, we could be here a while. Uh, Jesus might not come back as quickly as we had assumed. Uh, and now we're fighting and contending um, with... Uh, uh, ideas and beliefs and structures and societies that we hadn't hadn't figured on contending with, and particularly uh, the question now is how do you how do you how do you tell that you're on the right side of this conversation? How do you how do you know in the light of all of those people who are saying no, you got to believe this or you got to know this or you got to think this or here's the secret. Remember we talked about this last week, the Gnostics, the secret knowledge that creates an inflated spirituality um, that, that, that says it's at some level, uh, I, don't, I don't have to worry about sin anymore because I have this secret knowledge so whatever I do doesn't matter and John is saying no, 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 sin still matters. It will still take you out. It will still damage your soul irreparably. Right? And, 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 and so that's what we talked about last week. This week, we're going to talk a little bit about the secret knowledge people that enables them to separate from the body of Christ, from, from the faithful, right? Because uh, one of the things that happens when you get superior knowledge, right, is you just feel slightly better than everybody else. Anybody? Well, maybe no people like that, right? Uh, who, who, because they have some level of superior knowledge, uh, and, it, and it might be generated because they went to school, or it might be because they've been in the faith for a little while, it might be because they really have had some kind of revelation from God that is significant. And John says, Don't, those things aren't unimportant necessarily. It's just that the real test of superior spirituality is how you treat your brothers and sisters. It's not whether people are healed because you pray for them. It's not, which is cool. We want to be able to continue to do that. But that does character doesn't enable you to pray for healing because the healing has almost nothing to do with you. It has to do with the character of God, the love of God, the mercy of God. Does that make sense? So I want to be somebody through whom God can heal people. But I recognize that at the end of the day, that says nothing about who I am as a person in, this, in Christ. My character is marked more by love and how I treat uh, the, 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 the people who I might even think are the less thans. Does, does that make sense? So in, in 1 John, we're um, uh, in chapter 2, and uh, I'd like to just reset the, the stage here again. Uh, in, 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 in 1 John chapter 2, he is talking about the distinctions now between uh, the, 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 the Gnostic faith that says, on, uh, on, the, on the one hand, you have to have this secret knowledge and it moves you through uh, uh, what are called epochs or, or ages, if you will. Uh, and John's just so simple, so clear, and yet so, um, so deep. John is a, an, what I call an iconographic uh, writing. And that's, by that I mean, the, you know what an icon is, right? If you, if you see icons that have, have enabled people to pray in the church over the years, they're always bigger inside than they are outside. They, they usually appear in two dimensions, but they're windows into a deeper reality, and that's where John is with us. So John chapter 2, um, 1 John chapter 2, verse uh, 7. Beloved, I am, I am uh, writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. Now, at the same time, 
it's a new commandment that I'm writing to you. Because it's now true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away. The true light is already shining. Whoever says then that he is in the light and hates his brother is in fact still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother is the one who abides in the light. And in him, no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I'm writing to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Powerful, powerful passage. And it's one of those things that, again, uh, it, it brings us into the ellipsis of John. It, it, it sounds like, doesn't it, that he's going in circles. Uh, but in fact, there is a spiral to great depth if we will follow him along. So the first section is, beloved, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. What he's referring to here is the commandment of Jesus that we love one another. He, he alludes to it. He doesn't state it outright, but it is so uh, part of the, the DNA of the gospel that has been preached that uh, he assumes his readers will know specifically of which he speaks. So the first thing he wants us to underline is that, uh, to understand, is that what he's challenging us with here is not some new knowledge. It's really, really old knowledge. It's so old that we still have to figure it out. It's so deep and so profound that we think our, in our superiority that we can move past it. But it's like gravity. If you get gravity right, you'll probably be okay. But if you get gravity wrong, if you, in other words, if you, if you think you can live without awareness of that simple bedrock truth, you're probably going to hit up against reality pretty hard. So the reality is, this is not anything new. Don't, don't, you don't have to write this down. In fact, my guess is, if anybody knows almost any verse from the Bible, the verse from the Bible they will know has the word love in it. For God so loved the world. So this is not a new commandment. It's not new. We're not making anything up. This isn't new revelation. It's old revelation. Get used to it. Most of the stuff we are asking you to follow and believe here at the garden is, is nothing new. Now, this is a problem for a generation and a culture that prizes novelty before everything else, that wants the newest, biggest, bestest, fastest, mostest, whatever. And, and so, so we, have, we have reality shows coming and going, right? that celebrate the news of one kind or another. And John just says, look, anchor in the old. It's not, it's not new. It's old. Get this right. Get that first button in that first hole, right? And then you'll be OK. On the other hand, he says, uh, it's the old commandment that is uh, the word you have heard. At the same time, he says, on the other hand, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you. Make up your mind, John. Is it an old commandment or is it a new commandment? And I love how he does this. Well, it's old. It's been around since before you. How does it then become new? Well, it becomes new when you do it. Do you, you see what he's doing there? He's inviting us to actualize this ancient understanding. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's an old word. Nothing new until you begin to put it into practice, then it's new for you. It's easy to have this old commandment and kind of visit it every once in a while. You know, like in a museum, here's the old commandment. 
Isn't that cute? We carve Ten Commandments, and we salute. We raise the flag of love up the pole. And isn't that entertaining? Isn't that interesting? And John says it's useless if it's nothing but a piece of, of, of th thing to visit in a museum of old truths. It needs to become new. It needs to become actualized. It needs to become lived out in your journey every day. So it's a new commandment that I'm writing to you. And it's actualized in your experience. It's, it's put into practice in your journey. It's true in him and in you. It is true in Jesus because here now this love of God is worked out in, in the life of a, of, a, of a person who now models for us how we are to live out this, this new commandment. Because, he says, as you do this, the darkness is passing away. Do you see what he's doing here? God is light. Remember, we said this last week. In him there's no darkness. So how do we participate in the kingdom of light that is coming, pushing back against the kingdom of darkness. How do we participate in that? By embracing this new commandment and starting to live in the truth of it in our relationships with one another. That's how you participate in the coming of the kingdom, right? You love one another. You start to let love characterize your relationships. And as you do that at home with difficult people, as you do that with yourself, the kingdom comes. Light starts to break in. Have you, have, you've experienced that, haven't you? That as you finally are starting to get the truth of what God says about you worked into your own soul, you feel the darkness of humiliation, the darkness of shame, the darkness of condemnation begin to flood away as the light of love begins to take its place. And what is true now in you becomes true in your patterns of relationships. We're not interested in condemnation. We're not interested in judging other people. We're not interested in becoming an expert in their sins. We're just interested in letting the light of love shine and take care of the pushing back of the darkness on its own. Do you see what he's doing here? And he invites us into this. How are you doing this morning? Is everybody okay? I feel like we've just jumped into the 15-foot level here, and, and I hope, I hope you're, you're tracking with me okay. Uh, and, 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 and the key here to remember is that for John, uh, to obey is love, and to love is to obey. Why? Jesus, Jesus says this, if you love me, do what, do what I tell you to do. What does he tell us to do? Love one another. So if you love me, love one another. That's how people will know that you're my disciples. That's how people will know that you have been marked with my thumbprint, with my maker's mark, that you do to others what I have done to you and for you. So this is the invitation. Wherever, so, so, so here's how I think about this. Wherever you, whenever you find yourself in what I call a behavioral conundrum, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to regard this person. I've got a loved one. I've got a sister. I've got a friend. I've got a roommate. I've got a husband, a wife. I've got, I've got a, a, somebody I care a lot about. I've got a neighbor. I've got a coworker, And I don't know how to treat them because their lifestyle is X, Y, or Z other than what I think it ought to be. When you are in a behavioral conundrum, when you don't know how to act towards people whose lifestyles, whose decisions are self-destructive to them, here's the answer. Act in love. Not in truth. In love. Why? Because love will make way for truth if truth becomes necessary to speak after love, it will only be love that has created the space for truth to be told. Does that make sense? If you speak truth first, love rarely follows. Right? But if you speak love first, if you live love first, if, you, if, if they know, whoever they are, remember we don't get to have they's anymore, that you love them, 
then you have the right to live truth. D does, this, does this make sense? It's really critical. So, so if you can think of it this way, truth, truth is, is the guy with the ball. Love is the one that opens the hole in the line. Now that was a football illustration. I've been practicing for opening season. How did I do? Was that, is that a good one? All right. Yes. So, that said, look at what he says next. Whoever says, listen to the shift, whoever says he is in the light, who has the superior enlightenment, the superior, whoever says that, don't go on what they say. Watch how they treat their brother, their sister. If they hate their brother, no matter what he says about being in the light, he's still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother is the one who has settled down and made his home in the light. In him, there is no cause for stumbling. He doesn't put artificial boundaries and barriers to fellowship. If you agree with me on this, then we can be friends. No, in him, in the one who lives in the light, in the one who lives in love, there are no conditions to relationship. Right? There's no stumbling block that's put in the, in, 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 in the way. And, and please remember, people rarely stumble. Uh, 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 that's not quite right. Um, in terms of our relationships, it's often our judgment of them that causes people to stumble, even more than their own behaviors. Does that make sense? Isn't that true for you? Uh, when, 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 when we are in, in relationships and, and we feel people are, are dismissing or are disregarding us, it's often that disregarding that puts a stumbling block in our path, even more than whatever it is that we're doing. And so John says, if you live in love, if you live in the light, you're not going to be a cause of stumbling for other people. This is so, so important in the culture that we live in right now, Right? that, that, that it, when, when, when people are asked to characterize evangelical Christians, you know what the answers are. We're condemning, we're judgmental. And do you know why that's the popular conception of us? Because it's true. We're putting stumbling blocks in front of people. We're, we're blocking them from access to the only light that will drive out whatever darkness is in them. And John says to us, if you dwell in the light, if you've settled down and made your home in love, and please notice he's not talking about hallmark love, where everything's fine. He's talking about a gut level, I will lay my life on the line for you, love. When you do that, you don't put stumbling blocks in front of people as they make their way to Jesus. Why? Because whoever hates his brother is in the darkness. They walk in the darkness. They don't know where they're going. They're blind. Wow. Jesus, you will notice regularly, referred to the Pharisees particularly as blind guides. This is where John picks this up. The people who are experts in other people's sins, but blind to their own, are in fact not only not helpful to other people, they're going to end up in the ditch themselves. So this is what John is saying. If, if, it, it, it doesn't matter what you say. As you move forward in your treatment of others, this superior spirituality, if it disregards a brother, it's not very helpful either to your brother or to you. When he says hatred here, by the way, he's not talking about wishing harm. He's not talking about animosity. He's just talking about lack of love. That's all. Because we're polite people. We don't hate anybody. Well, maybe a short list, right? We just don't wish them well. We don't pray for their prosperity and their blessing. We want God to get them. And John says, mm -hmm. no, no, no. 
No, no, no. That's not your job. There is an agency. There is a force, as I mentioned to you before. There is a person in the universe who is calling God's judgment down on sinners, who is regularly drawing God's attention to those who are breaking the rules, who is regularly pointing out the damage and destruction that persons are doing to themselves because they are not obeying the commandments. There is a being in the universe who does that. His name is Satan. That's what he does. He says, have you considered my, your servant, Bill? And God hears the complaints of the adversary and filters them through the love of his son. So he doesn't need you piling on. The counsel of God does not require you amening Satan with regards to other people's sin. I would rather be on the side of Jesus and the angels. Amen? Amen? So here's where he invites us to. And then he goes on, and I love this thing because he's just, he's just playful in this. John is this childish old man who loves the round robin, who loves the merry-go-round, who loves the carousel. John is the guy at the top of the biggest roller coaster in Magic Mountain with his hands raised up waiting to die. This is John, right? Here is an old man. He has nothing left to lose, and he just sings this wonderful song. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him. I'm writing to you, young, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. Second verse, I'm writing to you, children, because you know the father. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him. I'm writing to you, young men, because you're strong. The word of God abides in you. You've overcome the evil one. What's he doing here? John's not talking about chronological age. He's talking about spiritual maturity. He's saying there are basically, and, and classical writers in this have, have, have been playing with this song, this melody, this beautiful riff of John's for 2,000 years. You can, you can read it in the literature. Who are the little children? Who are the paideas? They're the beginners. They're the, they're the new converts, if you will. Those, they're the ones who have recently discovered that the God of the universe loves them, knows their name, invites them to fellowship, and has forgiven their sins before they even ask. The little children, in other words, celebrate forgiveness, and well we should. I never want to get very far away from being a little child. I never want to forget the excitement of knowing that all is well with my soul. Even though all hell is breaking loose in and around me, I want to know that he and I are good to go. I want to know that my sins have been forgiven. I want to revel in the wonder of that. I never want to lose track of sins being forgiven. But, John says, if all you ever do is focus on sins forgiven, you will not make progress towards righteousness. Because sins forgiven is a backward look. Do you see what he's doing here? So the mark of, 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 of beginning maturity, the mark of the beginner, is this focus on sins forgiven, is this focus on the connection with the Father. All well, all good, but it's a starting place, not an ending place. I want, I want my sons to know me as their father. I want them to know that there is nothing they can do in this world that will change my loving orientation to them. That's true. I want them to know that. But I also want them to grow up. I want them to move out of my house. I want them to get their own lives and begin to move forward. Do you feel the difference there? And so, so for those of you who are relatively new to the faith, who have just rediscovered this or have just come in, that is so cool. Now, here's the next stage of the invitation. He, John takes them out of order. 
So I'm going to put them back in order and suggest that the next group here are those who are, are, are the, young, the young men, the young women, the contenders, the soldiers, the warriors, the fighters, those who are in the battle. They're not worried about not sinning anymore. They have made progress. They are now, he says, using this strong language. They are involved in, 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 in strength. They are involved in the word of God. They are overcoming the evil one. They are engaged in spiritual warfare. They're pushing hard against the kingdom of darkness. They are, they are contending for the light. They are working hard to get it right. They know the word of God. They have memorized it. They contend for it. They argue about it. They fight for it. They are holding on tight. These are the young men. Do you feel the difference? This is not just celebrating. I'm loved. I'm loved. I'm loved. Isn't this great? I'm having a wonderful time. This is like, okay, this is going to get down and dirty. We're going to do warfare. We're going to push back against the kingdom of darkness. We're going to lean in. We're going to do the hard work of faith. I'm going to memorize the scripture. Because that's how you know the word of God. Do you feel the difference? In the, the, the little children, what do they do? They receive. They receive forgiveness. What do the young men, the young women do? What do the soldiers do? What do the contenders do? You know what they do. They are engaged in battle. And they fight. Can anybody rec identify with, the, with, the, with that middle group, that young men? I think that's probably the majority of us. And that's a good thing, by the way. We need those folks. We need those people leading us in worship who will lead us forward into battle in worship. We need those people who are leading our prayer walks. We need those people who are understanding, right, that, 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 that this isn't about sins we're given anymore. We're making progress towards righteousness. The word of God is shaping our souls. We're leaning into this. We're pushing hard on it. We're abiding in the word. Um, and, and please notice in this, this is, this is um, for John, not just a strategy. It is a, it is a, um, um, let me, let me when, I was a, when I was a pastor, uh, I would regularly, or not regularly, but occasionally have people who would, who would leave my church, which, you know, fine, but this is the language they would use. I'm just not being fed. That's fine if you're a child. But if you've made some progress into adulthood, feed yourself. <laughs> do, do, does that make sense? Get your own Bible. Read it. Underline it. Do you have questions? Fine. Dig out the answers. Send me an email. Send Darren an email. We'll help you understand it. Get a book. I've got a book. I've got books. There are books that can help you understand the word of God. Don't just take what you get here on Sunday mornings. Dig into it. Take the life group curriculum, the uh, community group curriculum that we do. Dig in. Start to think, how does this work itself out? I don't think God knows what he's talking about here. He does. So bring, your, I don't, you, bring yourself back in. Do you see what I'm, that's the difference between the children and the young man. <laughs> Throw your babies in the air, it's time to grow up, right? And John says, in addition to that, when you learn the word, when you memorize it, when it starts to work itself out into the fabric of your life, now you can really do harm to the kingdom of darkness. You can contend against the evil one. You can push back. You don't have to take anything lying down. You might die, but that's okay. There are worse things that can happen to you, like not dying. So he invites us into this. Here's the problem. When you're a young person, Young man, young woman, when you're contending, you define everything in terms of for and against. You define everything in terms of right or wrong. You define things in terms of black and white. And of course, I'm always on the right side. So I contend, as a young man, a young woman, I contend for being the right. I contend for being right. I will take you down. So the early stages of my journey with Jesus, I could argue 
any theory you want about second coming and about how salvation works and about how the, how the Bible gets interpreted, and I would, I would insist on being right. That's a young man's game. Nothing wrong with being right. It's just the, like what Dallas said, I mentioned this before, it's hard to be right and not hurt people with it. So notice what's the next mark of maturity. These folks have moved from the certainty contended for in young adulthood to the trust of old age. These are the fathers. These are the guys who have gotten beat up a bit by life. These are the guys who have discovered, these are the women who have discovered, right is not all that it's cracked up to be. Certainty is less important than trust. How many of you who have been Christians for a long time and maybe would start to think of yourselves in the category of the fathers, the mothers, know things with less certainty than you did when you started? That's the mark of maturity. It's not, you, now, now remember, you got to go through the middle to get to the end. You got to know where, where the bumpers are in the bowling lane of your life. How did that one work? Was that okay? So you got to know where the edges are, right? But when you get old, you don't need them anymore. You're not anxious about it anymore. The goal is not to get all the pins knocked down. The, bowl, the goal is to have good time with the people you're with. What? It's not to win? No, because when you're a father, when you're a mother, when you've been around for a while, you realize you're already home. You've known him since the beginning. Notice what he says here. I just love this. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. So now we move in our relationship from God. Little children, father, warriors, general, fathers, creator God in whom I exist and live and move and have my being and whose image I am. Do you feel the shift? I don't have to be right. I don't have to contend. I don't have to argue. I can just be the beloved of the Father. Please notice, superior spirituality is not marked by anything other than a journey towards love and light. It's not where you are that matters. It's the direction in which you're heading that matters. So John, John invites us to, to celebrate the children. He invites us to celebrate the, the, the young men and the young women, the warriors, the contenders. We need them. But, but he also invites us to say, can we keep moving on? Can we keep moving on? Can we keep growing up? And what's the mark of growing up? I've given up my right to be right. I don't need to be right. I just really want to love you well. I want to walk in love with you. If it's really important, you'll get it. The Holy Spirit will come to you. He'll straighten you out. That's his job anyway. I just want to create a soft space for you to land in when you've been crushed by reality. Do you, do you see? I want to invite you to this, to this, to this, wonderful place of contentment where you know him who has known you before the beginning of time. 